uniform or not uniform their internal dynamics are. Right, so uh, let's start with a brief overview of how uh, wondering of how FATU components in general have been cl classified. If they're periodic or pre periodic, then uh, we all know, and that goes back to Fatou himself in the 1920s, that by the Dunjwa Wolf theorem, we can classify them in, in, in neatly into one of five types that everyone here knows and that we won't really dwell on. For wandering domains, which I won't define for the 10th time in this conference, um, the classification is much more recent and it's due to uh, Anna, Vaso, Nuria, Phil, and Gwyneth a couple of years ago realized that you can take Riemann mappings from your wandering domains down here to the unit disk up here and study the dynamics of this non-autonomous sequence of, of mappings up here, right? And there should be text down here, but this is on the way, in the way, but anyway. So the idea is that uh, since the Riemann mappings preserve the hyperbolic metric, they can study the behavior of the, of the hyperbolic metric down here by studying the behavior of this non-autonomous sequence up here. And that allowed them to prove the following classification theorem, All right? So if you take any simply connected wandering domain of some entire function f, then the behavior of, of u falls neatly into one of the three following categories, right? It's either contracting, meaning that the distance between pair, pairs of orbits goes to zero for every pair of orbits, Semi-contracting, in which case the distance between different pairs of orbits decreases but never reaches zero because the orbits are socially distancing. Or it's eventually isometric, which means that uh, eventually every pair of points freezes at a fixed distance from, from each other, right? Except maybe for a countable set of pair that have, has the bad luck to collide before that happens, but we won't talk about them, right? But the important thing about this theorem is that Whatever happens for one pair of orbits happens for all pair of pairs of orbits simultaneously. And what we want to talk about here is how things are not the same in multiply connected wandering domains, right? So our example will be an entire function with a doubly connected wandering domain represented here by this annulus because no one has yet managed to actually get a picture of a, one, a multiply connected wandering domain. Whoop. Please excuse us for a moment. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how to. Yeah, so to the best of my knowledge, no one has yet managed to draw uh, a picture of a multiply connected wandering domain, right? They're too big. They're, the, so one, there are two problems with that. So one, uh, no one knows of an explicit function with a, of an explicit entire function with a multiply connected wandering domain. And two, these domains are too big. So if you want to see the domain, uh, so you say if you want to capture the outer boundary of the domain, then the inner boundary would be so, so, so tiny that you wouldn't really be able to see it well, right? But the... <laughs> yeah, that would be a, a nice approximation. I could... <laughs> I could, yeah, I could just show you a, a nice blue circle here and just put a, a black dot in the middle and say, look, this is a doubly connected wandering domain. But <laughs> yeah, so I chose to use this, this standard annulus here to represent your doubly connected wandering domain. And the thing, ha what happens in this case is that if you take this pair of points shown here, um, right? So this pair of points shown here, so sort of on the same, radius, then the distance between their orbits uh, is in fact going to zero, right? Can I move this away? Yeah. So the distance between their orbits is in fact going to zero. But if you choose this pair of points along the same uh, spoke of the wheel, as it were, then uh, their distance, the distance between the iterates is constant for all n, right? So this is a contracting pair. This is an eventually isometric pair. And if you take pairs of points that are neither on the same circle nor on the same spoke, then they are semi-contracting. The hyperbolic distance between them decreases 
to a non-zero constant without ever reaching that constant, right? So in other words, we have two collections um, that form two transversal foliations of your, of your wandering domain. Points in the same leaf of the red foliation C are getting closer and closer together until their distance vanishes. Points in the same leaf of the blue foliation are staying the same distance apart. And any other pair gets close, but not too close, right? So the, the main message here is that all of the things that we saw in, in simply connected wandering domains are happening simultaneously. So the question that we want to answer now is, okay, so having one pair of, of orbits doing something is not sufficient to have all pairs of orbits doing that same thing. But can we get some condition that will allow us to say, okay, so now every pair of orbits in, in this domain does the same thing. This domain is uniform, or to use another word that will show up, unimodal. And it turns out that we can do such things, but we, first we have to make uh, some, some footnotes, right? Some terms and conditions. So if your domain is simply connected, then uniformity means that all pairs of orbits behave in the same way. For us, in some cases, we'll have to talk about um, uniformity relative to a base point that we chose in our wandering domain. So we say that you, our wandering domain, is contracting or semi-contracting or eventually isometric relative to some point Z0 in you. If the hyperbolic distance from any other point relative to Z0 behaves in the, in the prescribed way that we want, right? Contracting, semi-contracting, or eventually isometric. And so with that in place, we can state our theorem. So our theorem says that if you take a meromorphic function f with a wandering domain u, and you take some non-empty open subset v of u, then if v is contracting, then so is u. And this is all of you for all pairs of orbits. If V is semi-contracting, then so is U relative to Z naught in V, right? So in this case, you have to choose some base point in your open set before you can say that, okay, now this domain is uniform. And if V is eventually isometric, then so is U again, the whole of the domain is then eventually isometric. And I'm not really going to dwell on, on the proof of this theorem because it's kind of long because each of these three cases well, has to be treated separately with different techniques, but I'll be happy to take questions uh, on how to prove it. The, the, the proof is kind of interesting. But okay, so now we know that a sufficient condition for uniformity or unimodality in a wandering domains is to have a non-empty open subset that is in itself uni uh, uniform. So what can we do with this? What we're going to do is give um, a new example of a multiply connected wandering domain that is semi-contracting, uh, uniformly semi-contracting or unimodally semi-contracting, what have you. So the motivation for this is the following. Um, if you take a meromorphic function with a wandering domain u, then of course, if u is simply connected, then um, Anna and Anna Vaso, Nuria, Phil and Gwyneth show that they are always unimodal, right? And furthermore, they show that all three kinds of, of unimodal simply connected wandering domains exist. So you do have contracting simply connected wandering domains, semi-contracting simply connected wandering domains, and eventually isometric simply connected wandering domains. If it was multiply connected, on the other hand, then we can search the, the literature and we can find examples of contracting examples, so one contracting example due to Phil and Gwyneth, and other eventually isometric examples due to uh, Baker, Coaches, and Lou. But I don't really know about um, a unimodal semi-contracting wandering domain, right? So what we're going to do now is we're going to um, use the previous theorem to somehow fabricate um, a function with a wandering domain that is semi uh, unimodally semi-contracting. So the, the, the theorem goes like this. There exists a meromorphic function f with an infinitely connected wandering domain u 
right? We, we know that this domain has to be infinite, infinitely connected because if, if it had a finite eventual connectivity, then it's, it's, done, it's internal dynamics is sort of, are sort of prescribed by its eventual connectivity. And if it does not have an eventual connectivity, then things, get, things can get very ugly, right? So this example sort of has to be infinitely connected. And this wandering domain U has a non-empty open subset V such that U is semi-contracting relative to any point in V, right? So again, uh, the condition that we had in the previous theorem shows up to haunt us now because you can only talk about semi-contractingness relative to points in this domain. And now we're going to actually talk about some details of the proof. How am I doing for, for time? 10 minutes, okay. So, okay. So for our proof, you're going to ruin what was a perfectly good, simply connected wandering domain. And uh, people online or in the audience, please tell me if you can see this. So their example goes something like this. We have domains that are roughly disks. Did I? Okay, can, any, can anyone see what's, what's going on here? Okay, so we have domains that roughly look, look like disks being mapped into the next domain that roughly looks like a disk and so forth and so on. We have an entire orbit of things like that. And the function f that has this, this oh, g, sorry. And the function g that has this wandering domain uh, when you restrict it to the domains, which we're going to call un, un plus one, un plus two, et cetera, et cetera, it looks roughly like, uh, I mean, up to a, a, a small error and a translation that, actually, let me do it like this. So it is essentially up to translations, which we are sort of ignoring because it's, bothersome to write all the, the, the translations. So it's roughly um, a Blaschke product of degree two, right? And these constants a n here are real numbers between zero and one which are increasing to one um, sufficiently quickly, let's say. So we're going to take this. It's nice. It's simply connected. It's semi-contracting the functions entire. It has an orbit, a nice neat orbit that goes from here, right to here, right to here. And what we're going to do is we're going to cut out a hole around this orbit. We're going to cut out a hole here and a hole here and a hole here and inside this this new hole that we have we're going to put the function phi which is a Joukovsky map so it's essentially uh z plus one over z times some constants uh mu n and mu n and lambda n that will show up later, right? So it's this nice rational map of degree two. Uh, I'm again omitting the, the translations that would be necessary to actually move along. But the, the nice things about this, this function is that uh, it's gonna take this, this nice circle here. It has a pole in the middle, so it's sort of gonna turn things out. But eventually it's going to get this nice circle here and it's going to take it one to one onto uh, a nice little ellipse sitting around here. And now we want to glue this, this map with our original function, right? So we have our poles and now we want to another color 
we want to glue these two functions together. So we're going to take another annulus out here. Or oh, well, another circle out here. And we're going to quasi-conformally interpolate on this annulus here. Right. And so, uh, and so now what we have to do is guarantee that this construction here gives rise to a meromorphic function, right? So uh, now it's time to do some elbow grease. Uh, we're gonna, we have to massage uh, these constants here and this sequence here. So we have to massage them a little, treat these terms nicely. And if we do this, um, there's a certain way to do this, guaranteeing that uh, the dilatation of the quasi-conformal homeomorphisms that we get on these purple slices is nice, right? So the dilatation is going to one as we walk along the orbit at a sufficiently fast rate that we can apply Shishikura's principles of surgery and show that this function here, which is going to, which is going to be quasi-regular, is actually uniformly quasi-regular and therefore uh, quasi-conformally conjugate to some meromorphic function f, right? And now what's left is, is to show that this new function f um, has the things that we're looking for, right? So again, uh, if you massage these, these terms here even, even more, right, you have to impose further conditions on how fast this sequence goes to one and um, what this term looks like and what these terms look like. But there's a way to do it uh, in order to guarantee that you can find some nice annulus, uh, that there exists a topological annulus around here of orbits that never enter uh, the purple or the, the orange areas, right? And so an orbit that starts out on this annulus is going to be, so when a G orbit that starts on, on this annulus is going to be quasi-conformally conjugate to an F orbit all the way, right? And if it's going to be quasi-conformally conjugate all the way, we can use some neat estimates on, the, on how quasi-conformal maps affect the hyperbolic metric to show that inside this nice blue annulus, uh, F, our new meromorphic function, oh, sorry, has um, a wandering domain. So first, this wandering domain is infinitely connected, right? It has, well, it has a pole here, right here in the middle. And this pole is gonna have free images that accumulate on the boundary. Right, so it's got lots of pre-images going out there. And more importantly, our function F is semi-contracting inside this annulus A, right? So this annulus A is going to play the role of the open set V in our previous theorem. And so we can apply the theorem that we saw before to say that this whole wandering, new wandering domain U is uh, semi-contracting relative to any point that we choose inside the blue annulus, right? So we used on um, a new theorem about how having an, a nice little open set of points that behave nicely means that your whole domain actually has to behave nicely. And use that to, to construct a new wandering domain where things are nice, basically. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Questions and comments, please. Uh, I saw you used a specific uh, semi-contracting, simply connected wandering domain example. Mm -hmm. Could you have used any of the other ones that we know of? Or was this mm -hmm. Blasky product very good for you? Good question. So I used the I used the example where orbits stay away from the boundary because it was easiest to get. Uh, this purple annulus here. So one of the conditions on how to get good dilatation is that this 
we need to have a, a, a modulus that's sort of controllable. And if you take, if I were to take one of the examples where this orbit is going to the boundary, then uh, this annulus would have to sort of vanish around the orbit and then things would get more complicated. It's probably not impossible, but it does make things a lot more complicated. But we could maybe use the same thing to get most of the connection wandering the main sphere orbits like going to the boundary in a non-trivial way. Okay, thanks. Good question. More questions? Okay, no, no, question. So you start by saying this result of uh, all these people who are working in this internal behavior. Uh, and that was, as far as I remember, it was in the entire situation. Yeah. So, but this classification is, is in the case that F is entire. But your case, so you move from entire to metamorphic at some point. Yeah. So what happens is that their classification um, works for meromorphic functions as well as long. So the only thing that you, you'd have to do is the additional assumption that all your iterates are simply connected, but then uh, the classification goes over perfectly. But the, the problem now is uh, we can have mostly connected wandering domains and we can have wandering domains where you start out simply connected, then you become multiply connected, then you become simply connected again, and then things get strange. But... More questions, comments? Questions from online par participants? If not, uh, thanks uh, to speaker again. Thanks, everyone.